welcome everybody. Whoa. I think I can be a little more relaxed. It's a small group. To our third annual community conversations. Um, we're always happy to see an engaged citizenry and um, always happy to have a venue in which we can listen to you and talk with you. Um, I want to clarify that this community conversation, six months from the last, doesn't represent a move to twice a year. That would be such an enormous amount of work. Um, it's here because, for two reasons. One is because of the election this fall. We're going to be really, really busy and we wouldn't have time to um, have a community conversation then. And also to coincide with the production of our annual report because a lot of the information that we report out to you is in the annual report. So I really encourage you to either pick up a paper copy, there's a few of them on the village table, or it's also on our website, accessible on our website. Um, lots and lots of information in there if you're interested in village operations. You're all most likely familiar with our council, but for those who may not be, we have with us tonight Councillor Christine Latimer, Councillor Dallas Bullock, Mayor Andrew McCracken, Councillor Holly Blanchett, <laughs> and Councillor Sandy Salt. So let's give all of them a hand. <laughs> I want to thank staff again too for the tremendous amount of work they've done to prepare for this event. It's no easy task, takes significant time and energy, and somehow they fit it in, in addition to all of the regular things they do. And I just want to recognize them for all the great work they've done. Let's give them a round of applause. And I also want to introduce our newest staff member who started with the village only yesterday. He's been really helpful in preparing for this event, so please welcome Cam Bell, the intern we've hired with the assistance of NDIT. Cam? And although they aren't here with us tonight, we're also happy to announce two other recent hirees, Umesh Agnew as our summer Water Smart Ambassador and Dave McRae as our summer groundskeeper. And I know it sounds like a lot of thank yous, but it re the credit really is due here. We also want to thank all of the nonprofit groups in town, but particularly those who made the effort to um, present or exhibit here tonight and be available to provide that information back to the village. They all provide so much to our whole community in terms of the, what they do and it's, it's nice to give them an opportunity to let people know what all they're, they're about. So finally, oh a big round of applause for them as well. <laughs> So, to our agenda this year, we've added a welcome from the mayor. So let's give a hand to him. Oh, enough with the applause. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. We're not here to applaud. Let's face it. We all know that. Um, so the community conversation is an excellent time to connect. And it may be pleasant, it may be unpleasant, but we're going to connect either way. Um, it's important for us to get in touch and stay in touch because we want to serve you well. And in order to represent you and do a good job for you, we need to listen. Um, we often end up on different pages. Council makes decisions uh, sometimes that make people go, what? And I think it's worthwhile saying probably the reason for that largely, is because we are trusted to look after an organization that represents the whole village, that has $17 million in, in assets. Um, most of that is underground, right, with the sewer system and the water system. Um, we see the world a little bit differently than people on the street, but nonetheless, good dialogue is the way forward and a really important piece. In fact, we're legislated, we, we are required um, to have this annual report, and that's our, our I guess, our, our commitment to you, to tell you what we've been up to. Um, sometimes there's a disconnect between 
certainly between how I feel about the prospects of Vilma and how people in the street feel. And I just want to share why I feel a lot of optimism and hope for Veilmount. And I think it's worth stating. It's all stuff that you guys know. Um, but it bears repeating. And I think compared to other communities, you're going to get the sense of why we've got such a leg up. First is clean water. We have a 35 square kilometer watershed with zero industry in it. There's logging that happens in it. It's logging done by our community forest. So we're able to do that. We've got a hand in that. We've got a hand in the management decisions of the logging of that watershed. We have control of the forests directly around us. And we've been using them to generate wealth locally. We have outstanding terrain here, which has already generated an incredible amount of tourism. And there's some awesome trails right now. There's some, so many wonderful things. We have, I think, lay people might not totally be aware of this, but we also have, thanks to council, an awesome relationship with First Nations. It's a relationship. It's not you know, a contract or anything. But we have a really good relationship with First Nations. And we talk, when we want to talk about the future of Vilma, what we want to do, we're on talking terms. We have a some shared understanding about what's good for this area. Those are some of the things that we've got going for us right now. But the future is, there's, there's a lot there on the, on the horizon. On the immediate horizon, I just want to talk to you about why I feel hope. I don't want to take responsibilities for these things. We are, of course, the sole shareholder of the community forest. The community forest is managed independently of council, although we have representation there. Um, uh, Councillor Dallas Bullock and Councillor Sandy Salt uh, sit on the community forest board. But the community forest is working through um, an expansion, an expansion that's essentially designed to create small-scale milling jobs and more harvesting jobs here. This is barring major disaster in the near future. This gives me cause for hope. Geothermal power, we recently went to NCLGA and received near unanimous support from member municipalities, sorry, of the North Central Local Government Association. All the, all the northern municipalities took a look at our proposal around geothermal, suggesting to the province that they need to really work on this file. They need to give it the energy that they're giving to LNG, really, because it's the, it's the future. And it happens to start here in Velma, but all the better for us to be um, ambassadors for it. And all of those member municipalities supported this, despite their association affiliation with natural gas or whatever their current um, bread and butter is. They see the potential in this. That's something we'll take to UBCM in September. Positive, hopeful news. And I should recognize that we're getting new support from BC Hydro and the Ministry of Environment for geothermal power. There was a little bit of a breakthrough last year when we were talking about the results of the Columbia River Treaty, what that meant for us. And they said, yeah, maybe we do need to, we have an obligation to help you guys figure out what power looks like in your part of the world. Um, that, so how many communities can you think of that have the potential to turn the relationship with BC Hydro on its head, where we could develop industry around uh, a heat resource that could be achieved for less than natural gas prices. This is absurd. It's such an amazing opportunity. I'm not saying it's a certainty, but I'm just saying these are some of the things that give us hope for the future. The new mountain bike trail system that's being worked on uh, cooperatively between Varda and Yora is just amazing. So here's the new reality for Vailmount. We don't have to wait for Can or Slocan in their corporate headquarters in Vancouver to make decisions about whether Veilmount's going to be working or not. We, we have an influence in this valley, and most of these projects, I haven't even mentioned the, um, the, the mountain resort thing, it got left off my list, but we have an influence over so many of these things. So we have the possibility of creating jobs and opportunities. 
an interesting point here, just to sort of soften the crowd up, is that these ideas and concepts have come from the community. Um, and the purpose of us meeting here today is to ensure that we continue to have your buy-in and to field new good ideas. So, welcome. I, I apologize if that sounded rather stern, but I, I, I take it really seriously. It's kind of the heart and soul of the work that we've been doing. And um, I was going to launch into a tirade about how you know, people never show up, but then I realized I'd be saying that to the people who show up. It'd be really awful. So no tirade. But it's really great that you're here, and thank you for participating. And I think I can't overstate the fact that we, we want your approval, not just because we want your approval, because we want to feel cohesive as a community that we're moving forward. And that's the reason that we have this thing tonight. So in the evaluation forms from last year, and we do look at those, we heard two things. And one of them was less strict adherence to timelines. So we're right on, bang on with that. So right now, <laughs> right now we want to move into the door prizes. So if we could have a counselor, or two counselors. You're winning? Okay. We need someone to draw and someone to announce it. Paul, John oh. Paul Johnson, what does he win? Oh, the a mystery gift bag from Community Futures. He, he wins a mystery gift bag from Community Futures. I think it's a $100,000 loan. Oh, somebody has to hand it to him so we can be official. <laughs> now we're drawing for a uh, radon testing kit from the Fraser Basin Council. Kids, this is a lot of fun. Don't eat it, but... Joe Nussi. Joe Nussi. All right. Okay. We have a composter and a wing digger. Yeah, from the regional district of Fraser, Fort George. <laughs> oh! Pete <laughs> Pearson. Yay! Woo! Okay, and the village has donated a bag with a number of goodies and a two year tax exemption. No, 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 just kidding. <laughs> Uh, there are a number of goodies inside, including a hose timer for easy and efficient watering. So almost as good as a tax exemption. And that goes to? Jan Vanderswan. Jan Vanderswan. <laughs> Who's not here? She left. Oh, okay. Is that? <laughs> so one of the other things that we heard last year was Less talking, more listening. So what we want to do this time is really listen to you. Um, so what we'll be asking you to do is break into five groups. There'll be small groups of four to five people. There's two, one group at each of those back tables. There's two groups around this uh, divider thing and one group up at the council table. Um, if you just kind of found, find a table, we'll get one counselor to go to each of those groups. What we want you to do in five minutes is generate the ideas that you think um, would be topics of importance to talk about tonight. And then in the next couple of minutes, narrow those down to the top three that you think you'd, um, that you'd like to, to be able to comment on. We'll um, get you to come back together um, and give you time then to put your comments and questions to council on those topics. They'll be listening rather than reporting out responses back to you. We'll then have an open floor, if we've got time left, for topics not identified as priorities. And finally, at the end, we'll ask you to go back to those breakout groups and identify the top three questions that you would like responses to as a result of what you've heard tonight. So we will be reporting back to you on, on those questions that you would like answered. But given, given the... Um, less talking, more listening that we heard, it seems to be the best um, compromise for that. So right now, if you could choose one of those five stations and kind of try to spread yourselves out a little bit, and if I could ask council to go to each one.
That'd be great. I mean, it didn't make bad one. I think the right way to phrase what I want to have. Yeah. Those who can do their work from home. Now we all have to come up and you gotta make a choice. So you get three votes, you all can. I panic when I have a camera in front of me. I'm gonna listen to that brand. They're having some more public conversations about that, right? Okay, so that we know that that's. Yeah, there's no many new possible. So how can it be done? more than past years that was a tenth. But man, at two hundred thousand dollars, even one season of that directed towards a facility again, such as a bike park, we'd have a building here. It is, it's added expenses and you're doing you're doing things for the community. Parking okay, there's no parking for our slits. going to get Braden to read each of the 15 topics just quickly at the beginning and then we'll just go through them one by one. If there's any repeats or topics that are really similar, we'll be able to identify those and not uh, have to go through them the second time. And just to clarify, I'm reading all 15 in a row or are we reading one and then having a conversation? Okay. AHRT amendment to uh, the 2% infrastructure tax, uh, CIP CBT major project collaboration, so thinking about uh, the CBT funding and how that's allocated, uh, zoning and OCP, affordable housing, uh, this one's interesting, over hiring of seasonal workers and staff, okay. uh, energy cost sharing, incentives for business development, Quality control over contracts, community hall user fees, power outages, GITC, housing and transportation, VGD, gap in skills for sustainable workforce, uh, the ski resort need more public input and discussion, and water meters. Are we getting them when? How much will they cost? That's it. AHRT amendment, 2% to infrastructure. All right, so anybody who has any comments, um, there's a mic available here, or if you are unable to leave your seat or uncomfortable leaving your seat, Braden can bring you the um, little gizmo he's got. So basically the question is, uh, we all know that you're bound by provincial rules, but it's kind of a feeling that we're advertising for tourism before we've actually built the infrastructure. We have this money, it's a, it's a continual supply, and wondering whether or not it might be possible to push to change that because it seems like an opportunity that we really need to seize advertising come later once we actually built the trails and boardwalks that everyone's supposed to come here and use. Uh, what is AHRT? Additional hotel room tax. Uh, there was a request from the audience to just clarify what the percentages are and what the implications of the, the 1% and the 2% are. Uh, we charge all of our guests 2% on top of the room tax. So if, you're, if your room is $100, then you get charged 2% of that and it goes right back into the community. And uh, the, the government will match that by another 1%. So we actually get 3%. We get 2% from the consumer and 1% from the government. Right now, I'm not sure of uh, the breakdown in the budget, but the budget's done. Uh, uh, you have that? Okay. Yeah. Sylvia will tell you um, what we've put into the budget. 
two uh, percent are for promotion and marketing. Unfortunately, it's totally regulated by provincial government. Cannot be used for infrastructure. It's the Hotel Association of British Columbia in a certain way that has agreed with the province that that money can only be spent for promotion and marketing and not for infrastructure dollars. That's going back to Joe's uh, question. And it's very unfortunate. And the 1% is divided in two, 70% for infrastructure, and in the past five, six years has always been used or allocated for the Cranberry Marsh Trail. And the other 30% are divided in two parts again, 15% for the Winter Festival, another 15% for the Summer Festival. And unfortunately, it's very strongly regulated, and no community has ever been allowed to use the 2% or 3% according to different other communities for infrastructure. And Joe, I totally agree with you, and we try to make the request all the time too and see if we can use some dollars for product development. I know it's a big issue. I apologize for getting up twice. Um, uh, Two-part question. How much money is that annually, and who is administering it? Thank you. The 2% is around $100,000 annually, and it's managed by the Tourism Committee. The Tourism Committee is a committee of village, of council, and so everything first is discussed, then approved by the committee, and submitted for final approval to council. So in the end, council is the responsible with regard to the contract, also with the provincial government. And the 1% is a real contract with the provincial government, and it's around 50,000 on a yearly basis, and it's again the 70% for Marsh, and the other two, 9,000, 7,000 for the two festivals. And an important thing, in the last few years, we have banked the amount for the marsh, and it's for completing the trail portion where we have planned the boardwalk portion of the marsh. Banked means that money is sitting there, and we hope that pretty soon we can complete that missing link that's from the canoe launch to the sewer system. Okay, seeing no other hands, I'll move on to the next topic, if that's okay. Uh, so this one is major project collaboration for the Columbia Basin Trust Community Initiatives Program and Affected Areas Program. And I just wanted to make, to reinforce that we're primarily here to listen, so mostly we won't be getting full answers like to that last question. If if you provide us your questions, we'll be reporting those responses back and be able to give you a, a really complete answer that way. Just a really short background on this question here, on this statement here. Um, we all know about our community initiatives dollars that we receive and they're quite substantial for the community and they've done some great things in the past. Um, they have potential. Other communities have, have kind of laid the way of doing some pretty major projects with a, a greater collaboration for the community initiatives projects. Um, and it's just a suggestion that we as a community potentially look towards some prioritization with even recreational groups, community groups, nonprofit associations, uh, and see what large tasks we may be able to take on with uh, this sustainable pot of cash that we have through the community initiatives program. Um, whether it and I guess prioritize our needs as, as recreational groups and nonprofit societies and, and to decide the best use of this of this money in the long run and the bang for your buck that we can get that'll long last to the kind of the uh, the legacy of this fund. It's kind of the direction of that question. <laughs> okay, noted then. Okay, uh, the third topic then that came up, the last one from this group, uh, is zoning and OCP, the official community plan.
Yeah, we were just discussing how part of the livability of our community is having a strong downtown core, small business district, making it easy to, to get around from different parts of the community. And we think the Belmont's doing a good job of that, but we're also going to be undergoing some changes if we have a larger influx of people. So that was part of it, keeping a centralized downtown core. Uh, the other part was um, housing and zoning strategies to discourage uh, absentee landowners and speculative buyers of property. Okay, uh, so moving on to the next group, uh, the first topic is affordable housing. Anyone? There's a need for not only seniors housing here, but there's a need for housing for seasonal workers and uh, uh, the, um, the workers that come from out of, out of our community for young people and, uh, and also for families. So that's why I thought that should be up there. Okay, second, second down the list is, I uh, apologize, I think I misread this before. Just ever so briefly, I think it's only fair, just to let you know that, so very briefly, that council's working on doing an assessment, or not council, but we're trying to have an assessment done with, uh, by CMHC, I believe. We'll see if they take us up on it, um, to identify what our housing situation is and what our needs are. So, hopefully, um, if we move forward, we'll have a real basis and however they do it, you know, they, they do the study and have ways of finding that out and then we'd be able to use that to go forward. And one of the interesting, probably not the least interesting part of that is we could use that as a baseline for if major projects come through, what the requirements are for employee housing. So we don't get into a, a you know, a stink where we, you know, we, we, we really have a crush on affordable housing. If we know we're at the level right now, or if we know we're already missing, then we can make sure that those are prioritized. Yeah, that's an important part of the picture, yes. So including uh, um, th those properties that are vacant, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, the next topic then. Oh, sorry. For me, it's a question I don't know, not so much about the Canadian system, but, but it's behind the question. What do you expect? Is the government, the town should build affordable housing? Private ownership is a private public ownership uh, uh, ownership thing. So it's that's for me the question. What's behind that? Who's responsible for that? Or is this a wages problem? The people make too less money to afford the homes. I think from from a world view, the amount is cheap. From the other view, perhaps it's too expensive. So it's what's the question behind? Who who can solve that? I think not the council or you will increase your taxes. Somebody has to pay it, I think, that's a problem. I, this is related for me to the other topic when we uh, discussed all the topics about the CBT program. Why is it not include in the senior housing to fix their fire doors? Th the renter has to pay that. I think so, I, that's for me, I'm perhaps a stupid question, but there, I think we should discuss those things, but what is the right place? I don't know. Okay. Uh, if we're okay on that one, the next one then uh, is the overhiring of staff and seasonal workers and the cost implications of that. time you turn around you have someone new working someone else planting flowers 
Last year, we had a water ambassador and someone mowing. They've moved on to other jobs within the, in the village, for the village, and now there's new faces there, like, come on, what's up with that? You don't have a week to answer because we're not really getting answers on some of these things. We had 10 minutes to come up with questions. And that is one of my real pet peeves, is the amount of people that work for the village. And I believe that probably we have more people working for the village than most small cities do. So. It's, uh, it's like a regular slow can over there. So that's good. So that's something we'll report back on. Thank you for bringing that up, Shirley. Comments? Okay, then. Uh, the next item, energy cost sharing. And I'm looking at expenditures to go down. It says to reference Owen. So, <laughs> so I might do that. We have a lot of uh, different uh, governing bodies overseeing infrastructure here in the village, regional districts, school districts, village, uh, private ownership, and uh, got to be a, somebody needs to spearhead uh, these facilities and uh, and others, uh, district heating, uh, and it just get our reliance off of propane and onto something that we can all use uh, responsibly and there's funding options out there and, and just going after the right grants, the right uh, funders. Uh, you, you got the Western uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities will give you low interest loans. You have other uh, NDIT grants. We're in that magic little triangle of CBT, environment, uh, community conference, uh, you know, Curtis, if you wanted to uh, take on a, a worthy project, uh, lowering the cost of living here rather than raising the cost of living and having a snowmobile, uh, let's let's go the responsible way and not the expensive way. Okay, thanks, Owen. Uh, there's no other comments on that. Uh, on the top of the next list, rather, is incentives for business development. I guess the next one is quality control over contracts. Okay. Well, I'll talk about the future, and Sylvia will talk about the past. Um, so the future is uh, um, we had a bunch of work. So, and it connects up to another question we're going to get next. Uh, but just briefly and not trying to be too laborious or, or combative or anything, um, we had about $200,000 of work done on this building um, and midstream council came over and checked it out and we were really displeased with what had happened and there was sort of uh, half finished things and council, this council um, took it to the thing saying, yeah, um, to the main contractor, if, if this is not solved, you're not getting paid. And that worked itself out, I think. We were very pleased with what we, the, the end result. I, anyways, so that's just an example. Sorry, I just thought of it. I was at your table when you thought of the question, but it just occurred to me that that was actually an example of us taking it through to, the, to that. And for any type of major project, like in the downtown uh, case, the village hired an engineering company. The engineering company worked as a project manager and of course also they guaranteed the quality. We as village do not have a planning office, we don't have a, an engineer inside of the village or a planning department, so we trust the engineering companies that we hire. And we even had to pay, no, and unfortunately we even had to pay a lot of money for that, right? But that's the reality. So it's, it's an important complaint, but the village did everything that the village could do.
now I forgot my question. Um, no, but you mentioned, Silvio, there that there was a guarantee associated with the engineer slash planning contractor. And have we gone back to him to, to repair the damages and the issues that have been created by that said engineer? To my knowledge, not. Uh, when this building was renovated, uh, there was one large contract given. And uh, I went and I talked to the village administrator of the day, who's not here anymore. But um, um, they said, no, the reason that they did that was that uh, economy of scale. But um, what I was thinking of is local economy. And we had uh, contractors, local contractors, that those jobs could have been given out piecemeal and that money would have stayed in our community. And I just uh, hope that you'll take that under advisement. Thank you. No, I should probably refuse the, the you, you know what, we're here to listen, and that's a really good point. That, that's a great point. And I, I think something we uh, struggled with at the time of that, and I think it might have implemented a little bit better in the case of the Bigfoot Trail maybe an example of something that worked a little bit more like, like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the last one on this list is community hall user fees. Someone would like to speak to that. Dave. I just have a concern that as volunteers of the community, it's always Everybody works for free and tries to put community events and stuff on and then you have the village wanting to charge to do this sort of stuff for different things and it's wrong. You have volunteers that are doing things, bringing revenues to the community. I feel the village should be doing something for community projects and stuff. Okay, thanks Dave. Uh, second on that list is GITC. Oh, sorry, pardon me, I skipped one. Power outages. Thanks, Alan. Um, the question was uh, from Dan Clay, which I know he's not going to stand up and say anything. Um, and it was basically what, what's happening with the power outages and, and, and the IPP. Um, and what, um, what can the village expect when power outages go out? Um, the local people and the guests coming to the village cannot get gas anywhere. They can't leave town. They can't um, eat in a whole lot of places. They can't stay in a whole lot of places if the power is out for any length of time. So it was a concern for the local people and for the guests of the village. And what's the next steps going to be for handling the power outages? Now we're on to GITC. Uh, basically, uh, my question was, uh, I was just wanting to know what was going on with GITC. I understand there was problems earlier in the year. I wanted to know, basically my question was, um, is the village still, uh, does the village still have ties with GITC? And that's about it. Um, so GITC, um, we have some partners at the province, um, the BC Securities Commission that are taking a look, and so we've asked our provincial counterparts who have way more resources than we do to give us a sense of where that's at, and that's really where things lay right now. And um, there are some concerns raised, um, and we've got... We definitely are in good with the province who is looking into that, so that's where it's at. Maybe you have a follow-up, I don't know. So, okay. Should I, should I? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so GITC was an investment group. I mean, ultimately they, they became, 
Okay, I'll explain it this way, and it's probably a little unfair because there's a, a few insertions, assertions on my part, but I'll harken back to a story of when I was in university. I was at a house full of uh, Indian foreign students. You need great grades to be an in, a Canadian foreign student, and you need $10,000 in the bank. And essentially, by pooling resources, um, a group of Indian kids have no problem raising $10,000. You just get $1,000 from all your friends' families or whatever and put it in the bank and, and gain access to Canada. So I believe that the GITC was um, sort of a, built on something like that model that had worked um, in smaller sort of familial kind of things. But the problem is, if you get a bunch of investment money together um, and promise people that they're going to be investing in Canada, you become kind of somebody that the Securities Commission needs to know about. It's no longer just sort of a, you know, you know between us friends. And I think that that was the big hitch. So uh, that's an extreme oversimplification, but that's the idea. GITC was in sort of uncharted territory for them. They did not expect to be there, to have obligations to go under GIT, to, to go to the BC Securities Commission, et cetera, and be like, a, you know, basically an, almost an international traded company. So there are big requirements on that. And the last that I heard, that's what GITC was working on, working through that. Okay, move on to the next one. Uh, the last one in this list is housing and transportation as it relates to Belmont Glacier destinations. Hello. <laughs> That was my question. Um, related to uh, Bobby's, I think, about housing issues, you know, what we have available here, especially if we get a whole bunch more people for, VGG would be one example, but there's lots of others that are potential. Um, and I've also heard of people that move here right now who have problems um, finding a place to rent. Um, but the other thing would be transportation, looking at how we get people, especially with VGD, um, how do we get people back and forth between this community and that resort? Um, I like the idea that they're thinking of moving the access road to the airport, but that road would be a little sketchy with 150, 300 cars up and down it every day, I think. Just. That's a really that's a really good concern to hear. No. Okay, uh, three left. Uh, the first one, gap in skills for a sustainable workforce. If uh, one was looking for work from Alberta uh, in Belmont, it was challenging to find because you don't really know who to talk to and who to look to. So um, this kind of drew my attention to um, a gap in the skill set in the community and what the community is going to need in the future. And so in order to train people that are living in the community or people that are coming to the community, you have to have a training facility or a center in the region. And these are usually funded on a per capita basis. So possibly um, focusing on if the village was to focus or if the community was to focus on who they want to attract and what type of skills they want to attract to the community, it could have a positive impact on training in the future. Do you have a follow-up? Just want to grab the mic. I'm actually not part of the community yet. My husband was born and raised here and we've been trying to move back to the community. What we see is we find on the internet through the BC job postings that there's jobs available here, but as soon as we apply, boom, they're gone within the day. And it's really frustrating to someone that had to move away from Belmont to find work to 20 years later when they find, you know, that's where I really want to raise my children is we can't come back here because the work isn't here or the work's being given to who you know, when you know, right there in the split second. Of course, that's every community, who you know, what you know, 
but it's very frustrating to those that have moved out of the community and trying to come back and bring their families back. Thank you. Okay, number two. Ski resort, uh, a need for more public input and discussion. Herbert? Everybody knows I support fully the ski resort, but I'm a little scared what's happened when the master plan is approved, and that's perhaps faster than we are thinking. Perhaps it's in the next summer. And then it's every, everything going fast. And when we start the discussion, what we really want in the city. And I think we have to do that in this summer or in the, in the next winter. What we are feeling in our stomach, should this be part of, from the town or should it be outside the town? And this is not a, a problem from a scientist from somewhere for $50,000. It's more feeling what we really want. I think we have to do it. It's an opportunity. I think it's a big opportunity. It could be less property tax. It could be higher. I don't know. We will see it. But I think we should discuss it before and then not when the money is coming and to say, no, you have to accept the money or nothing. And that's a bad situation, I think. It doesn't? It does. Okay, well, I think there's a couple things here. I think, um, yeah, I really agree with what you're saying. I've had a similar thought, actually. Um, but yeah, that's probably a little off topic right now, and everybody else up here is gonna wonder what I'm thinking. But um, a couple things. So for the, from the village perspective, in terms of taxation, um, implication for the village, we are conducting a boundary expansion study, which includes public input. So that, that is that side. But I think you're also right. There's sort of a community feel thing. I'll give you an example of something that I, I th so I've been thinking about this a lot, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I believe in the master plan in one of the early, early documents, there was discussion about a pool, you know, which I gotta tell you, I'd love to be the mayor that brought a pool here. I mean, whatever. <laughs> but I'd love to be that, you know, during that time, you know. Because that would really change things. A lot of people would want to come to Valmount if there was a pool there too. It excludes a lot of people. Now, the developer offering us that is one thing, but the community coming together and saying what it is that we want is another. One is being almost parasitic and the other is being a part of the process. And I think we need to not just accept what comes, but be a part of determining how it works. And who knows, maybe with that, the developer's vision of the pool, maybe it's not exactly what the village is interested in. So I think obviously to do it in the same, same vein as you're thinking, like collaborative, uh, positive, and yet we have a responsibility here to say, when the, if this thing happens, what do we want as a village? And I think that's, that would only be good for the developer. If people feel like this is a thing that we have control over, rather than something that happens to us, oh, hey, out, here's your pool, here's your, you know, uh, 50,000 tourists in a you know in three month window or whatever. I, I think we need something like that. I have a question for you. Do you think that's a, partly a responsibility or not a responsibility? But do you think that would be something that the ski society would be good at? Great. So the last uh, topic identified: uh, water meters. When are we getting them? When? And how much will they cost? Let's hear from the question asker. Some, some citizens said to me it's cheaper for him to be in town instead of building out of town and build everything on his own. So somebody has to be careful, everybody has to be careful what he is talking about. But I think the only thing is here in town what we really need or what the town needs is a water meter, to be fair. I think it's an, uh, you uh, ask about the uh, uh, business incentives. Can it be that the business without any more water use has a double fee? And we see now what's happened in Victoria, a town in the 21st century without a septic system now has to build one for 800 million. And I saw in Global that cost every little building, uh, business 2,000 extra dollars a year. That's unbelievable. And I think 
we have to think about it, and only then we have a fair price per square meter or per liter, and everybody knows what he is doing. When he is doing watering his lawn, he has to pay it, I think so, or not with a fee, a yearly fee from 500 or 300 dollars. So I think this must be fair, and the cost cannot so expensive, cannot so high, I think, so for that. Are they going to be just implemented for businesses to start, or is it going to go to the general public too? I'll answer that one a little bit. Uh, so far, they've been implemented in some businesses. Uh, hotels have them. Um, and then I think new commercial undertakings are required to put in water meters. No, not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. So I think Anne would probably have the answer to your question. Sorry. We're actually doing a water meter study this summer, and that's going to identify the, the costs. It would identify what would be an appropriate schedule. It will identify some appropriate funding and um, which, which would be the most appropriate model for Veilmount, whether it's commercial only, what they call ICI, institutional, commercial, and um, industrial, thank you, <laughs> or uh, universal. So the study should help us, um, tell, should tell us that. Maybe, maybe we're being, Maybe if we have to build a bigger water plant to accommodate use, we like from that perspective. So, good management is what we're looking for in terms of. So no, I don't think we're being forced. I think we're being we're definitely being encouraged. Government is certainly pushing, uh, guiding us in this direction. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, but I guess the question is, what is good management? We recently it was worth noting we went through the really. We thought community uh, community user fees at the community hall was was troublesome. Uh, the charging businesses six hundred dollars a year. Like there were some businesses that were getting water and sewer for about combined about like one hundred and eleven dollars per year, if I'm not mistaken on that. But very low, um, and it was implemented in kind of a weird way where some businesses randomly they weren't using any more water, but because of their the label of their business, they were getting charged $600. Um, and so it comes to light that it is completely arbitrary. <laughs> it really is arbitrary because it's, yeah. So it's not like it makes the cost go away, but at least it, it uh, water metering might provide more fairness. So if somebody's using a ton of water, and I mean, it costs, it costs to do that. But I think another thing is the, also, realistically, the cost of producing the water is one thing. Um, there's, there's maintenance and there's all that stuff on the water system that's required. But there's another huge thing that, it's all the infrastructure underground and including sewer that costs just, a, it just, it's outrageous the amount of money we've got invested in. Well, it's good. I mean, it's what municipalities are for. In fact, Valmont was, the reason Belmont was incorporated in 62 is because finally the community had agreed that we're going to do a water uh, thing. And so we incorporated so we could charge taxes so we could have clean water because we were having an issue with outhouses and, and, uh, and uh, you know, people's water systems were becoming compromised. So that's kind of what we do. But I guess the idea is um, it's pretty evident that it's pretty unfair. So do we need to look at that and make it more fair? Or is it worth it? Or is it just so expensive that the water meters wouldn't really pay off? Or if we had to pick it up on our own bill? But if these governments that are so, other levels of government that are so interested in having us water meter, if, if they pay for it, then I mean, that's a totally different, different situation. I hope that uh, you will take it under advisement that there is a, a real concern about uh, uh, Wi-Fi and uh, smart meters. And uh, the evidence is, um, um, there's more and more evidence of uh, health concerns, especially, um, and I hope that uh, if there is metering, that it will be done without uh, radio transmitters. When you get to the stage, if it's actually going to be implemented, is it going to be consultation with homeowners to either have compensation for the installation of it, 
and that could be adjusting and moving the water lines and any renovation expenses that may be incurred in, in installing those water meters. So one of, the, one of the purposes of the study is to identify funding sources and payback periods, and, and that would largely determine the viability of the project. So it would be um, a viable project would be dependent on at least some outside funding to implement those. And why we suddenly need water meters. Less people, less, well, less people. We used to have double the amount of people here. There was no talk of water meters, and now all of a sudden, God, we got to have this, we got to have that. There's nothing left of Belmont except what we try and make, and then suddenly we need water meters. So during, uh, after the Swift Creek uh, blew out in 2012, uh, we had repercussions of that when the pumps blew up as a result of that. So basically, um, in the spring of 2012, uh, Swift Creek blew out, almost took out the pumping station, but it didn't. But it really uh, caused havoc with the pumps. In September, we changed out those pumps for maintenance because they weren't working quite right. They weren't pumping in capacity. Or at some point during the summer, the pumps were changed. And then we had a major blow up in the water system. Um, our, our pumping station in, uh, at Swift Creek functionally exploded. I mean, it was water to four meters, uh, or to, to a meter, anyways, um, four feet. And so what we did was we put out the word, you know, uh, flyers and get everybody around town. Uh, to say, look, we're in a crisis, uh, don't use water, and whatever. And we were without water within side of 24 hours. Um, anyways, so we're sort of responding to what we're experiencing, not what historically has been, I, I guess. is any, You know, I shouldn't defend our stuff, I, we should just listen, so I'll just listen. The village did a major expansion of a brand new water facility that was supposed to last Belmont for two weeks. Well, guess what? People are using more water than ever. Or there's leaks in the system, or something is going wrong, but something's going wrong. Having 24 hours water supply, to me, is not right. People are using way too much water. That would be my thing. We need to be conscious about our water use. From what it sounds to me, it's like you, you're saying that because we had this episode at Swift Creek, now we need a water use. So the, the episode at Swift Creek demonstrates that we, we, are, we do not have a ton of capacity in the system. Yeah, that's the link. That's How does that change? So if people pay for use, they use less. Rather than water meters, like looking at putting a gravity feed system further up the creek, so you do have the capacity of water that you'll need to run out that way? Yes. The talk of water meters has been on the plate since the new water treatment plant was in the works. Council previously knew that there were going to be new costs associated, and, and the village was forced into putting in that water treatment plant because of all the concerns with the water. We didn't have proper water treatment, and we were being forced by Northern Health to do that. And at the time, we were lucky enough to access funding from other government agencies to help us build that plant. So the, the thought of meters we knew was going to come down the road, but at the time it was like, okay, well, let's just carry on with the water conservation that we do and that we try to raise awareness on. We did actually, even though Anne is saying we're doing a feasibility study right now, we did a pre-feasibility study. And what that means is it was a pre-feasibility study to find out because we knew we were thinking about, do we, don't we, that told us, Yes, we should look at water meters, absolutely. And, and it's also a lot of work that we've been doing with Columbia Basin Trust um, as part of the, there's the, the Provincial Climate Action Charter, but there's also Columbia Basin Trust where we're with the Water Smart 
charter, I believe it is. And so that is something that Columbia Basin Trust actually is encouraging as well, is water conservation and through that, through metering. So this isn't something that all of a sudden, you know, why are we looking at this? This is something that has been in the works for many years already. And, and we're just carrying on to the next step just to look at the different options on alternatives and whether we actually will go there. But, you know, it, it is something that has to be addressed, water conservation. There may not be as many citizens, but we certainly have hotels. We have a lot of tourists coming, and we just have to look at that. So that's, that's where it is, global warming. I just have a brief question about the water meters. Um, I understand you guys are doing a study right now. Uh, when's the study expected to be complete, and when will you make your final decisions? The study will be complete sometime this late summer or fall. Okay. Thank you. So let's just open the floor. Um, if you have a question or a comment you want to address to Council, please come to the mic. We probably won't be responding to any simply to respect your time, but we'll give you all the time that you want to ask questions. The water meter issue gave me an idea. I think what could come out of this community forum is that we all have ideas, and it seems that the bridge between what Council knows and what we ask might be covered year round. I don't know if you could have a column in a newspaper, but it seems that we can ask better questions if we have a better understanding. Like I never saw the link between the water problem capacity and the meters. And uh, there may be very logical links and we can participate better in these open forums if we're better uh, informed and then we can think productively ahead of time. All right. yeah. Oh, so just a follow up is, what is the best way to consult you? And I think that'll be represented in your uh, feedback form or if it's not, just write it in there. But that's a real curious thing for us is how do we connect? Because sometimes we put stuff out and we feel like, but we get the question back. But that's okay, it's not a perfect process. But I think that that's a very good uh, point about the column is like, um, I do have a, so. Okay, also, uh, Councillor Latimer just said, there's the annual report there, which is full of, if you're a local government geek, like Paul Johnson, you will love that. The annual report is really good. It's filled with all sorts of stuff. I think some public disclosure stuff, like stuff you'll want to know. Like, I mean, for instance, the fact that we're considering water meters is there, right? So there's all these sort of potential surprises. Maybe they're not totally news items or something, but there's a lot of info there. Um, so that, that is a good, good thing. But um, I, I was going to ask for a show of hands and would a column in the newspapers, would that work for people? So show of hands for if that's a good... Yeah, not bad. Okay, sorry. Um, I just had a, a comment and uh, in regards to zoning in the OCP. I believe that uh, you did turn down the um, proposal for a storage yard on Fifth Avenue um, uh, last week or the week before. Or I'm not really sure where that's at. But um, if you haven't, please do. And if you did, thank you. Um, I don't actually think there's a heck of a lot wrong with our zoning. I think we're pretty well set up, and the town's pretty gap-toothed commercially. We just need to infill, and if council can just hold the line and not give away rezoning easily and not, you know, let the strip mall come in 2K down the road or not in our current district, the town's going to be more or less what we all want it to be. That was just my comment. What is the value for you in keeping the current zoning, just for other people who aren't in the loop? Well, the way I see it, we have a decent mix of retail on Fifth Avenue. We have the highway services, which is already zoned from the Best Western to Swift Creek for that. And we have the um, Main Street for historic and some light industry. We have heavy industry in the regional district. We, like, everything's there. We just have to force people, if you're going to buy a piece of property for this purpose, it's zoned for this, buy it for that, use it for that. So don't buy something, speculate, that you're going to rezone it and build a strip mall down the road. And that's entirely council. That's, you're the last line on that. And I think last week, that's exactly what you did. 
and um, I hope that continues. Obviously, we can't go tell old mechanic shops that have been in business for 40 years to spend 200 grand, but you're not moving in and lowering the common denominator. Uh, when will the OCP be updated? Uh, that's a good question. It's, uh, oh, maybe we've got an answer. Let's, let's try to just a okay, just a question so we can cycle through, yeah. So just a, a couple of comments, just with the utilization of Facebook and social media. Um, as of over the last year, I just kind of noticed there's been a lot of discussion coming from mayor and or council uh, on public discussion forums. Of course, the community residents then hence feel the need to obviously make a comment and converse. And unfortunately, it's resulted in a form of the view, let me rephrase this, the perception is that it's being viewed as bullying when a call is made by mayor, council, and or staff to remove their comment. And I think it's a bit inappropriate. Uh, that is the common conversation that's happening in the community about Facebook, the discussion boards. And so if you're wanting to utilize the public forums, please allow the community residents to voice their concerns as well. Just a quick question on the hydro. What do you guys pay annually to pump that water uphill? What is it, 300 meters? Between 15 and $25,000 a year. And how much do those pumps cost to replace? Like, they're, yeah. A lot, eh? The pumps, when we bought them, were around 125000 each. Yeah. So we have five because we need backups. Um, they're probably more expensive by now. Yeah. We haven't costed them out recently. And it, the cost for the um, pumping is thirteen to 15000 a year, but let's remember the cost of hydro are going up exponentially. Mm -hmm. And what about how much is done looking into the pipeline idea? Um, so there's actually on a map a 3.2 3 kilometer uh, piece up to where it would meet with Swift Creek and get a sufficient drawdown. There's a look at a small, generating a small amount of power with that. Um, we have a very, we have a feasibility study done. We're very lucky that we partnered with uh, John Wheeler, who's doing the um, uh, Castle Mountain Hydro in uh, McBride. He has a responsibility to, because he's putting a burden on the river system, he has a responsibility to, is this okay to talk about? Yeah, I think so. Uh, He's putting a burden on the on the Fraser River system, right? Because he's like damming up part of it and running it through a tube. Um, so he, part of his thing is to look. We're trying to work with. We want to be his project for remediation. The, the remediation would be this: remove the weir, make better salmon habitat down low, put a pipe in. This is a speciality. He's done all sorts of uh, power projects in the past. His suggestion here is go with something simple and. Uh, relatively inexpensive. Don't try to do a big penstock and generate a lot of power because the terrain actually doesn't allow it and the cost would get into the millions. Instead, um, something within the realm of possibility that, and we're looking to see what the possibility is in terms of, can we get something that we could pay off in five years with the cost savings? Mm -hmm. Cool, part of that plan, if you do end up ever going with it, can you incorporate a pipeline to trail conversion at the end of all that? That's a really good 3.2 kilometer section that would kind of wrap up the whole bike park. All right. <laughs> yeah. Hi. First, I'd like to congratulate the village of Aylmount for having these kinds of forums. I think that needs to be said. Um, there was some talk of um, a strategic uh, communications plan. Uh, a couple of years ago uh, that the village was going to embark on. And I was wondering if there's been any progress in that. And um, uh, well, I, I just encourage you to um, explore all kinds of um, uh, communication because I think that honesty is um, the best policy. And, um, and it takes a little bit of practice, not only for, um, and I'm not suggesting for you, but rather for the community, for people in the community. Um, 
I would have liked to have seen more people. I did not see a poster in town. Uh, what, what prompted me to come was uh, your message on uh, Facebook this morning. I knew it was coming, but um, everybody's really busy, and I know that you are, and I want to thank you for again for having this forum. How many people saw a poster? Just one. Okay. And how many people uh, saw it posted on Facebook? <laughs> what about how many in the newspaper? Okay. It's a Facebook and newspaper. Any other means? In the taxes. I would like to see those back in their mailboxes. We just found that we were seeing so many of them being thrown out into the trash can and people not reading them. So, you know, is that another option? If the electronic media is the way, then I agree. <laughs> sorry. Don't be sorry. We need we need feedback. We need to know. I'm, I've been watching the community from afar, from another province, as I've said a few times, and I want to say Belmont TV has been a big one. Not all family members could come to high school grads. We watch it on TV. It's really awesome to sit there and PVR it, and when they come out a year later, go, oh, I loved your dress. Let's look at it again. <laughs> and meetings like this are awesome. I have teenagers that are going into the voting age, and they're back home in Alberta watching right now. And I just wanted to say thank you for Facebook and the media, and that's where I see it. And we do recognize that not not everybody's electronic, and we we are really we're actually trying to do uh, on the tax bill in terms of just saving money, um, people opting into electronic. Pieces. I, that may not be totally accurate, but some of the course, some of the legislative correspondence that we have, switching people over who want to go over to email. So it's good. It's good for everybody, well, except the post office, I guess. Is there anyone else with anything for the open floor session? Okay. So I've been taking notes throughout this. Um, given that it's already 12 after 9, it's, again, your choice. We had uh, originally planned to have you break out into your groups again, and I identify precisely the questions that you'd like, but what we can do is we can report back out on the topics that you've identified and, and the questions that you asked and the comments you made then, or we can have you identify other questions that you want us to report back on. So, uh, sorry, Alan, well, you have a question? Ask if, if we're going to have you report back, basically, if we're doing it at a later date, what's going to be the previous form? How are you going to provide it back to us again? Right. We'd intended to put it into a written form, but perhaps give council a chance to speak to it if they like, um, and we'd post it electronically and, and provide, try to provide it as to as wide an audience as possible. So So, um, everyone who's comfortable with the questions being asked as they were presented tonight. Okay. Everyone who would like the opportunity to refine those questions or um, ask, perhaps change up the questions. Okay. Well, that's good. That um, brings us... Okay, and just one... Uh, you'll note that there were two, two questions that we didn't get to and didn't speak to. And I just want to say, part of, the, part of the, the blessing and the curse of this is that sometimes when we get different questions, we respond emotionally. And what we don't want to do is alienate you. And so there's a couple questions that we're just going to answer that way. I, I, I think it bears repeating because we did manage to speak to most of the concerns on there. But there's a couple hot topics. That's not because we're not brave enough to answer uh, for our actions in terms of the community hall user fees or share with you our thinking on that. And it's not because we're not brave enough to talk about the staff and justify. And I have a feeling that staff are probably gonna to wanna to do a comparison with a small city and get a sense of the value for dollar that's here. But the idea is not, not to turn it into a debate, 
but to listen, that, that's a concern. So we're responsible to come back to you on that. And that's what will happen with that. Okay, so thank you all again for coming. We really appreciate this. We like to give you that opportunity, give you a meeting. I do ask that you take the time to fill out those evaluation forms. That's what guides us every year into trying to make a be better forum for this to happen. Um, we appreciate your interest and your engagement and um, have a great evening, what's left of it. <laughs> <laughs>